Uh, today we have Anne Edminster with us to walk through some steps we can take as homeowners and occupants to increase our home's resilience in the face of wildfires and in turn reduce our carbon footprint. Uh, before diving into the main event, I'll just be rolling through some housekeeping slides. Uh, next slide, Anne. Okay, so I'm sure by now most of you are very familiar with Zoom, but we just ask that everyone make sure they're on mute throughout the course. Uh, however, if you'd like to verbally participate, please uh, raise your hand and we'll call on you to unmute yourself. Uh, we also encourage folks to ask questions through the chat box. Um, and if anyone um, has any questions, we'll uh, be sure to address them. Uh, this session is being recorded and uh, we will be posting the course on our website. Uh, you'll also be receiving the recording in an email that I'll be sending out after, after the event. Next slide. Apologies, we lost our presentation. Just getting back up to speed. All right, we're back. Okay, so just a few words about who we are. Um, I'm with the Tri-County Regional Energy Network, also known as 3C REN. We are a collaborative partnership between San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, and Ventura counties, working to improve energy efficiency in our region by offering free programs and services for building professionals and households. 3C REN is funded by ratepayer dollars, which are collected through the public goods charge found on our utility bills. The benefit of being ratepayer funded is that there is no cost to those we serve. And as a regional energy network, we are able to return these dollars back to our local economy, which has historically missed out on these funds. 3C REN has uh, currently three programs. Uh, the first is the Energy Code Connect program, which serves building professionals by offering Title 24 support for everyone from plans examiners and inspectors to architects and contractors. Within the Energy Code Connect program, we offer our Energy Code Coach service, which is an over-the-phone, online, and in-field support for Title 24-related questions for both residential and non-residential projects. We also offer online courses that are designed to increase overall energy code comprehension, compliance, and enforcement, and offer regional forums covering policy and technical issues. The uh, next program is the building performance training, uh, which serves building professionals such as architects, engineers, contractors, and real estate professionals by offering technical and soft skill trainings relating to building, building science principles, high performance buildings, marketing and communication techniques. And finally, we have our home energy savings program, which incentivizes contractors and helps residents save money and make their homes healthier with energy efficient upgrades through incentives and rebates. Uh, there are a few staff members on the training today. You'll find them by looking for our 3C REN background. Feel free to chat with them directly if you have any questions. Uh, today's course is designed to be an introduction. If there are any concepts or techniques that you have questions about, please don't hesitate to ask. 
And with that, I'll pass the presentation along to Anne. Thank you, Anne, for being here today. Thanks, Sarah. And um, sorry about the technical difficulties. I'm not sure what gremlins were at work. <laughs> These things do happen. So good afternoon, everybody. And thank you so much for joining us. Um, as Sarah mentioned, this class is about home remodeling with both fire resiliency and electrification in mind. These um, topics may not sound obvious companions, but it turns out there's quite a bit um, that they have in common and ways they reinforce each other. So we'll launch right in. So first of all, would love to get your responses to this poll to find out who's in the room. So. Um, if you D, option D is something where you can add something in the chat box and then Sarah can share those with us orally. So it looks like we've got more contractors than anybody else and then a smattering of other occupations. Sarah? Do we have information on our, our others? Yes, we have one program administrator. Okay. All right, great. That's really helpful. All right, we stop. We can have enough of that. Thank you. All right, moving on. Um, okay, so the first section of this uh, program is on definitions and benefits. Then we'll move on to electric upgrade options. So what do we mean by electrification? And then the third segment is on, okay, so now what does that all mean and how do we put it into action uh, based on our home and our goals? So definitions, first of all, electrification means we're transitioning from away from natural gas or propane fired equipment to the electric counterparts. And in homes, this typically means what we sometimes refer to as the big four, uh, how we heat and cool the home, water heating, cooking, and clothes drying. And there'll be more on each of these as we go through. So this is just the intro section. Talk a little bit about the benefits and how, again, electrification, resiliency, and um, efficiency, in fact, all go together. So benefits of electrification are in and of themselves fairly numerous. We are reducing indoor air pollution when we eliminate fossil fuel combustion from the home. We're also reducing safety risks in the kitchen. I'll say more about that in a bit. Um, electrification by definition means we're swapping out existing equipment for new equipment. The new equipment typically comes with improved features all across the board. So that's always exciting. And then of course, last but far from least is the climate benefit of switching to electrified appliances. A lot of this has to do with the fact that we have an electric grid that is increasingly cleaner over time here in California. And that's also true in many other parts of the country. And as you, some of you may know, the state has a goal of having a 100% clean electric grid by the year 2045 at the latest. And you can see we've got an estimate in SMUD territory that going to an all electric home, even at present, we're emitting 40% less greenhouse gas than an equivalent home that's powered by natural gas equipment. So that's a very big deal and an important motiv motivation. However, there's also a financial motivation. We have uh, research that's been done for the state of California showing that going into the future because of um, the, what we'll need to do to reach our state's climate goals, we will see less and less use of natural gas that'll be concentrated on fewer users and therefore the rates to those users will inevitably go up quite substantially because we can't spread those costs out across the entire population when we'll have a relatively small user base. More and more that cost will have to be on those, the backs of those who remain using gas. So when we talk about electrification and resiliency, I wanna 
really emphasize that we don't want to lose sight of energy efficiency. Efficiency has always been important. It remains important. And while there are a lot of um, voices right now in the energy space who are really focusing very hard on electrification, which is entirely appropriate, again, efficiency is still part of the picture for a number of reasons. Efficiency improves indoor comfort. Um, electrification per se will have no appreciable impact on comfort. Efficiency also reduces overall energy use. So that of course has um, an operating cost benefit. And because in many places, electric rates are higher than gas rates, this is particularly important as we electrify that we want to benefit from efficiency as well. So an efficiency in turn supports resiliency. How does it do that? Um, for one thing, when we have an efficient building enclosure, we can better maintain indoor temperatures in a comfortable range, even during power outages. If you're in a very, very leaky, poorly insulated home, then you're gonna be much more vulnerable to the extreme temperatures that I'm sure none of you have forgotten we all experienced quite recently. I believe less than a month ago, the entire state of California experienced temperatures over 100 degrees, which is certainly unprecedented in my lifetime. And this is more than a comfort feature, it's actually a life safety feature because many of our very young, very old and um, disabled or ill residents are particularly vulnerable to temperature extremes. And there are always spikes in death rates and hospitalizations during those efficient, sorry, the extreme temperatures. So really important. And again, further protection of indoor air quality as well, because when we have a more efficient enclosure, it means we have um, better resistance to intrusion by things like wildfire smoke, for example. So again, many benefits um, and also not only the wildfire smoke, but ember intrusion that is an issue when in proximity to wildfires. Now, here's an example of a project I worked on where many of these benefits worked together in the development of the solution. So as the photo indicates, this was a mid seventies home. You can see that there was deteriorated siding there. And so there was determination that the siding would be removed. That would enable us to air seal, install new cavity insulation, cover that up with a continuous exterior insulation that um, a product was chosen that was non-combustible. And then similarly, the new siding chosen was also non-combustible. So we see here are both wildfire safety benefits, efficiency benefits, and the, the yellow bubbles, which call out dual benefits, meaning there are benefits both from an efficiency perspective and a fire safety perspective. So again, air sealing helps prevent ember intrusion as well as improving thermal performance. And similarly with the continuous extra insulation that's non-combustible. Other things that we did on this um, house related to glazing, there was quite a bit of single pane glass in the home, which is vulnerable, more, much more vulnerable to um, the radiant heat and wildfires. So those windows, the decision was made to replace with dual glazed with both panes tempered um, using metal clad units as opposed to certainly no vinyl because that's the most vulnerable to wildfire. And then we chose compression closing. And what do we mean by that? Compression closed units are those that clamp closed and have gaskets to keep a very tight seal. So that includes um, awning units, hopper units, and casement units, which are certainly the most common. Any window that slides, whether vertically or horizontally, is by definition looser fitting in its frame than a compression closed unit. And so that really helps, again, both from a fire safety perspective and from a thermal performance perspective. Similarly, um, the dual glazing is a benefit from both perspectives. 
and the tempering and the metal cladding are fire safety benefits. And metal cladding, by the way, is also really terrific just from an overall uh, longevity perspective. Metal clad windows can reduce the need for repainting as compared to say a, a wood window that's not clad. So um, lots of reasons to uh, spend a bit of budget, sometimes a large chunk of budget on windows when you can, it's a very good choice. Um, on the same building, there were both vented crawl space and the vented attic. And we made a determination to eliminate venting in both of these spaces. And again, dual benefit from thermal performance and ember intrusion benefit. So this, uh, in terms of thermal performance, we moved the insulation from the ceiling level up to the attic or the roof plane level. This created a passively conditioned attic space, which was perfect environment to put a new mini split with all the ducting, therefore in um, insulated space. Similarly, in the crawl space, we determined that insulating the crawl space walls instead of the underfloor area would provide this benefit of, again, a semi-conditioned crawl space where the second mini split unit would go, the one in the attic conditioning the upper floor and the one in the crawl space conditioning the lower floor. So these, um, again, these benefits go together. Um, in terms of ventilation, so we are also improving the air quality with a uh, heat recovery ventilator Again, two systems, one again in the attic and another in the crawl space. So these also benefit from having these passively conditioned spaces to be housed in with their ducting and provide the health benefits of clean indoor air to breathe all the time and especially important during wildfire season. I didn't mention, but this home is in an urban wildland interface area. So this was a particular concern for the owners. Now, this is not something that was an issue for this particular home, but it's been raised by um, urban wildland interface experts. And uh, it's not popular with everyone to think about either eliminating or simply avoiding use of skylights. But the reality is that skylights, except in a very, very few climate areas, are more of a thermal liability than a thermal benefit. And this is because of A, the radiant heat gain during the daytime, which can, again, really exacerbate comfort issues in high temperatures and radiant heat loss at night. So increasing heating loads when it is colder. So admittedly, there are situations where the daylight benefits of skylights are quite important. But when they aren't or where perhaps fewer or smaller skylights will do, it's a great idea to consider reducing them. And then finally, the photo at the bottom center of this slide shows how skylights, because of the way they pop up from the roof surface, can really exacerbate the accumulation of debris on the roof which is definitely a wildfire risk. So just some food for thought when um, considering the benefits versus the liabilities of skylights. Okay, so Nat, back enough with the examples and on to um, the final benefit point here about how going all electric also enhances resiliency. And that is because power outages cause oftentimes both gas service to be cut off and electric service to be cut off. Electric service, however, is restored much, much faster after power outages. Typically in hours or few days, gas service can take weeks or even months to restore depending on the severity of the fire issue that has occurred. It also reduces the risk of on-site explosions. So during the 2017 fires in uh, Sonoma County, where I now live, I did not at the time, but the firefighters 
continue to be dealing with flames and a lot of risk associated with flame on um, properties where all of the structures had long since gone up in smoke because there was flaring gas lines. So this is really problematic that the fact that we have created our natural gas infrastructure in such a way that it creates ongoing burden and safety risks for our first responders long, long after they have put out the fires. So it's really good idea to eliminate these. Now, there are further resiliency benefits to going all electric when distributed energy resources are included. Now, typically what we mean by distributed energy resources are on-site solar and or batteries. So the benefits here go um, with solar, of course, utility savings month over month. 4% um, increased resale value has been found to accrue to homes that include solar. Clean carbon-free energy from your on-site energy production. And of course, power when the grid goes down with the inclusion of batteries. Now, even without batteries, solar can be installed such that one circuit can be kept functional um, with the solar in the absence of um, power. So, however, obviously there's a lot better resiliency to outages with batteries. So there you go. There's sort of the triumvirate of these, these three companions of electrification, resiliency, and efficiency. There's that. Okay, um, any questions, clarifying questions before we go into uh, the, electric upgrade options. Sarah, do we have anybody with a no, burning question? Nothing in the chat. Okay, all right, great. Well, we will move right on to what do we mean by electrification? So I've got, um, coming back to the big four and a couple of bonus items here. First of all, space conditioning. So when replacing natural gas or propane space heaters, with electric, our choices are twofold. Both of the options are heat pumps. There's a mini split heat pump and a standard heat pump. And these both function the same way. Um, and you'll see the standard heat pump on the right looks a lot like what um, a number of you probably have as an air conditioner. And if it, in fact, a heat pump differs from an air conditioner primarily in that it works bi-directionally, that is, it can cool when you need cooling and it can heat when you need heating simply by reversing what's going on with the refrigeration cycle inside the equipment. Mini split the same, it's just smaller and therefore good for either smaller homes or other spaces, accessory units, um, so forth or quite efficient homes. So if you have a really, really efficient enclosure, then a mini split may be adequate to serve your home. Even honestly, some not terrifically efficient homes can use mini splits. Um, I've heard projects where several mini splits have been installed in a single larger or not so efficient home. The option that you choose is going to depend on the classic, it depends. <laughs> um, list of things. What is your home like? What is its vintage? How well is it insulated? Is it fairly compact or is it more sprawled out? Is it single story, multi story? Is it open plan or more compartmentalized? So, this class, because it's very much sort of a 30,000 foot overview, won't go into the individual home solutions, but uh, always offer the advice to seek out service providers who work with heat pumps regularly, who are knowledgeable about the equipment options and the installations that are going to work best given the specifics of your perfect, sorry, your, your personal installation. So one thing to say about mini split heat pumps, often I'm seeing there's more of, um, let's say public facing information about ductless mini splits than ducted mini splits. So the big difference here is a ductless mini split typically is installed 
directly through a wall or sometimes a ceiling to the outdoors and it serves only that particular space. The example you see in the center photo here, this little console that's showing over the hallway is however an example of a, no, let me see. Actually, that is a ductless also. So that's an attic installation of a ductless and undoubtedly there's, it's going to run up through the attic to the exterior. In a ducted situation, a single mini split, such as the outdoor unit you see on the left, can serve multiple rooms with ducting just as a normal central heating or cooling system does. So whether that's suitable, again, is going to really depend on the specifics of the house. Um, for a while, we owned a rental unit that was 840 square feet and we used a ducted mini split to serve the entire house very, very comfortably. There are folks who've designed new homes from scratch that are super efficient where a single mini split has served over a 3,000 square foot home. So a lot depends again on what type of home you're dealing with. Okay. And Moving and on. Before yes. we move on, there's a, a question in the chat asking if heat pumps take longer to heat a home. Uh, that is an interesting question. Uh, no, heat pumps, I would say aren't inherently either faster or slower at heating a home or cooling it. Um, that's more a function of proper sizing of the equipment. So in other words, heat pumps come with different heating capacities, heating and cooling capacities. So that needs to be tailored to the size of the home. Um, and of course, it's also a function of, again, how efficient the home's enclosure is. And that's true, again, regardless of the type of equipment. I hope that clarifies. Okay, um, whoops, I'm going backwards instead of forwards. Here we go, okay. Um, heat pumps, once again, are coming to the rescue for water heating, electric water heating. They're not the only solution for electric water heating. We also have tankless water heaters. So the big difference is here. They're, they're much more different in terms of the pros and cons as compared with the space conditioning heat pumps. A heat pump water heater looks a lot more like a conventional tank unit, does in fact include a tank, it does need more airspace around it than a gas tank unit um, because of the heat exchange that's occurring. It can be a bit slower to recover when all the water in the tank is exhausted. So typically a larger capacity is recommended. If you're replacing say a 50 gallon tank, you might wanna bump it up to the next size. The tankless is the most compact option. So when your space is limited, a tankless unit may be a preferable choice. They are, however, much less efficient than heat pumps. The most efficient tankless unit is in somewhere around the 90 some percent efficiency, whereas a typical heat pump water heater that's on the market at present is generally gonna be more than 300% efficient. Now that sounds weird if you haven't been around heat pumps for a while yet. So how can something be 300% efficient? That has to do with the physics of the refrigerant cycle. Um, and I'm not gonna go into that right now, but it's the same thing that your refrigerator does. How does your refrigerator plug into a wall and yet create colder temperatures than there are in the surrounding environment. What's happening is it's borrowing or, or rejecting heat to the outside environment in order to make a colder environment inside. Heat pumps do the same, um, and a heat pump water heater, of course, in reverse. It's borrowing heat from the surrounding environment and using a refrigerant cycle to impart that heat to the water. So, Obviously, there's a threefold or more difference between the efficiency of a tankless unit and that of a heat pump water heater. Um, and you can see at the low end, of course, a tankless option can be quite inexpensive. At the high end, 
they're probably more at parity. So it depends on really, again, the specifics, your budget, um, the needs of the particular house. Um, there are significant incentives available for heat pump water heaters right now, and both through utilities, community choice aggregators, um, and the tech program through California. And there will be, uh, I think, a link to that at some point in this presentation. And if I have neglected that, we can add it before distributing slides. I'm thinking I might have. Um, and of course, there's a lot of money coming down through the feds from the Inflation Reduction Act that is going to mean even more money available for a number of these options going forward. Okay, number three, induction cooking. Now, again, of course, you can swap out a gas range for a conventional um, radiant induction, or sorry, radiant cooktop, but pretty much nobody wants to. Uh, switching from gas to electric cooking is often the thing that gets people sort of backing away and saying, oh, no, 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 you will rip my gas range from my cold, dead fingers. We want to try and change your mind here and really emphasize that induction ranges are an entirely different technology. They use magnetics. So you will need steel or iron-based cookware, and um, that's easy enough to tech with a magnet. Um, it's also a pretty small price tag relative to the cost of buying the range or the cooktop itself. So the cost of cookware ideally won't be an obstacle. There are also jurisdictions that are giving away sets of cookware to people who buy induction ranges. So keep that in mind. It's something to ask your, again, local utility or other um, provider. So there are tons of advantages to induction ranges, however. So they're cleaner. You'll see in um, both of the photos here that we're looking at very smooth glass cooktops. So the cleanup is amazing. And also because there is no flame and there is no heating of the cooktop itself, and I'll come back to that in a second, you can do crazy things like lay a dishcloth across the top of the cooktop, put your pot down, and then cook something. This is really great if you're dealing with something that has a lot of splattering, for example, because then when you're done, you can pick up the pot, scoop up the towel, throw it in the laundry, and your range top is still clean. So now about that, why am I saying that the cooktop doesn't heat up? Well, it does a little bit, but technically what's happening is the magnets in the cooktop are exciting the, um, uh, the molecules in your cookware. So the cookware is heating up and transferring that heat to the food. So yeah, of course, there's a bit of warmth that accumulates in the cooktop, However, it dissipates quite quickly and is not enough to start a fire unless, of course, you walked away and left something on the range cooking for an extended period of time. Most of these induction um, devices, however, have safety shutoffs that if something is left for an extraordinary period of time, they will turn themselves off. So it's almost impossible to start a kitchen fire and dramatically reduces burn risk as well. So cleaner, safer, they also, also offer much finer grained and quicker control. So again, one of the complaints, really honestly, the only complaint I ever hear hear from people who've switched to induction is, oh yeah, it's so responsive that I actually burned something I was cooking because I didn't expect it to cook so fast or worst case, I damaged a pan because I really didn't understand how quickly it was going to cook. So the good news is that if something is heating up faster than you expected, or even let's say not heating as quickly as you want it to, you can change that much, much faster than you can in a gas range. Because again, you're just increasing the activity of the magnets. So that transmits almost immediately to what's happening in the pan. So you can cool things down a lot quicker if you need to and avoid some of those um, cooking incidents that might otherwise be unpleasant. And also you can bump things up if you're being very cautious with it 
saying, well, I don't want to overdo it. And then say, well, oh, this is taking too long. Ah, bump it up. It'll respond very quickly. Um, and again, you can see the cost range for these appliances. There's a pretty wide range. So um, pretty competitive with traditional cooking technologies. On to electric clothes dryers. Now, there's only one picture because dryers, again, all are pretty much identical in terms of the gross features. Two options here. Once again, we have heat pumps on the right, standard electric on the left. The big advantage to the standard electric is faster drying time. And at the low end of the price range, you're not going to find a heat pump that will compete. On the benefit side for heat pumps is they use a lower heat, which is much gentler on clothing. They don't require venting, use half the energy of a standard electric. Um, Price-wise, at the high end, pretty competitive with a high-end electric, standard electric. On the con side for heat pumps, they have a much longer drying time. So if that's not a big deal to you, then don't be deterred. There are also combination units, washer dryers. And some people really like those because they say, well, I can put the clothes in, walk away, and the clothes get washed and dried. I don't have to remember to come make the transfer. So that is another option you might consider. OK, that is it for the big four. Moving on to the bonus items, fireplaces also often use gas to fuel them. So I've got a couple of alternatives for you here. One is electric fire appliances, as they are referred to. Disadvantage, well, again, you can't make s'mores on them. Some of them do provide heat. I'm not sure how useful that will be in a given situation, but there are some that are purely visual attractions and then some that, that have some heat options. The visuals are actually pretty phenomenal. They give a very convincing fireplace atmosphere these days. Huge price range, as you can see. On the right, this is my personal preferred alternative for people who are like, I just really love fire. Yep, we're humans. Fire is one of the elements. We respond to it in a really visceral, biological way. So uh, there are people who would be horrified that I would ever condone making a fire under any circumstances because it's combustion and contributes to the problem. Realistically, I think particularly in California, particularly in urbanized areas or wildfire areas, hmm, well, that represents a huge fraction of the state. Most people aren't going to indulge in a fire terribly often. So if you are, Obviously, you want to choose a time that is safe and where we don't have clean air alerts, um, embers are not going to be a problem, and so forth. But an outdoor fireplace give you that elemental experience at a relatively low cost and not pollute your indoor air. Okay, pools and spas. This is, in many ways, the trickiest. Uh, fortunately, this is, represents a, a minority of homes that have pools or spas, but for those that do, electric heating is an option. That said, it requires expert help to figure out the sizing and appropriate equipment. So um, heat pumps on the one hand, solar thermal on the other. Solar thermal can be a great option particularly in areas where most of the pool use is during the warmer season. If you want to use a pool well into cold temperatures, solar thermal alone is probably not going to be sufficient. So I've uh, included a couple of resources here. By the way, all the resources that um, have links, these are hot links. So when you get the PDF of the slide presentation, you'll have access to all the resources that I've provided throughout the presentation. So there, there's some articles here. And um, again, I, I'd say the paramount caveat here is seek out um, what I call adult supervision, which would be engineers who are already experienced doing pool and spa heating and will understand how to 
address the unique needs of your pool in your climate with your amount of water, your amount of surface area, and your heating expectations throughout the year uh, effectively. And by the way, I speak from painful experience on this, not in regard to a pool. I don't have a pool of my own, but working with clients, I have found that there are um, some folks who are offering advice who don't actually have a ton of experience doing this. And there are pitfalls that can really be only avoided by those who do have this experience. So with that uh, caution, we'll mon move on to renewable energy. So this obviously is on the side of the equation, not of things that use energy, but on the side of electrification where we're interested in providing clean energy to a project to um, counterbalance the demands of energy on the site. So in homes, we have a couple of options, on-site solar electric systems, of course, which we see in the upper right photo, and some of you may have solar on your homes, but also renewable energy providers will sell you renewable energy, and that might be through your utility or a community choice aggregator. And more and more areas within the state are served by community choice aggregators. Both utilities and community choice aggregators typically offer a 100% renewable service option. There's um, typically a small price premium for that, but you can consider either of these options or both together. At our home, for example, we, we were able to buy a home that had photovoltaics the PVs meet somewhere between a third and two thirds of our load, depending on time of year, obviously more during the sunny parts of the year. And we also have opted into the premium 100% renewable option with our community choice aggregator. So between those two, we are getting 100% clean energy, which is really gratifying. I guess is the right word. Okay, home batteries. Again, on the other part of the electrification equation. So one of the options, I'll actually start with the bottom option, solar self-consumption. If you have a solar array, you can actually use more of the energy that's generated by your rooftop because there's typically more that will be provided by your system then you may be using during daytime hours. So you'll be able to store that excess and then use it during the higher demand and high cost periods of the day. So right now in California, our um, peak periods are four to 9 p.m. So that's typically when people coming from home from school, from work, those who aren't all working at home these days, um, and there are more activities going on, particularly cooking, which tends to be concentrated through uh, the traditional dinner hours. And so there's an opportunity to use that solar energy during that period until the battery discharges and then recharge the battery after 9 p.m. Um, while the rates are down again. So the other option, of course, and perhaps the more obvious one is using batteries as backup power for when the grid goes down. And the battery providers um, generally all have apps. The apps allow you to specify the mode or modes of operation and also to um, override, for example, if you've set up a rule that says generally you want to um, rely on the self-consumption mode, you can always override that, for example, if a, an outage is anticipated so that you can save up more of what you've stored during the day for the anticipated outage. So that's a, a very brief overview of all that. Okay, so moving on to the transition plan. This is the final element of, of the lecture today, after which we'll have time for questions. Um, we have blocked out 90 minutes for this presentation. I'll be wrapping it up probably just a little bit after the hour, leaving quite a bit of time. So be thinking of whatever questions you might have. 
So the transition plan, we've been through the elements of electrification throughout this presentation. And so in thinking in terms of a transition plan for a particular home, whether it's your own or if you may be working with clients, um, I think we have one homer in the audience and the majority of you were folks who might likely be working with clients. So this is thinking in terms of working with them. And um, by the way, I'll, I'll offer a preview. In November, I'm teaching a class that's more specifically for building professionals on helping clients develop their home electrification plan. So it goes into this in quite a bit more detail. Coming attractions. Okay, so first of all, think about what are all the new electric items that might be in your future? I'm not, you know, I don't mean your next, you know, smart device, your, your next cell phone or game console or whatever, because those are pretty minor loads, but anything that's a major load. So again, the big four, EV or EVs in your future, battery storage in your future, even though batteries will save you energy, they also have an energy load. So it's important to understand what those might be. There are also some big energy loads that don't show up here, but to think about. Um, I worked on one project where all our energy projections for the project were kind of out the window when it turned out that the new occupants in the home had an enormous aquarium, for example, that was um, using a pump and heated water 24-7. So um, beware of things like that. Um, other things that might be big consumers could be um, a beer fridge in the garage, or if you do a lot of canning and have a big freezer, for example. So be thinking about all of those potential electric loads in addition to those you may already have. So plan ahead. Um, did I skip something? Okay, so the second step, and by the way, I've, I've listed these not in the, let's say we'll call the gospel order, but sort of the order of um, the most, let's say, forethoughtful and easy transitions to make if you proceed in a stepwise fashion towards electrification. So the next thing that you can do, this one's the easiest thing to do is to reduce your demand by replacing electric equipment appliances. So this is either plug in, plug out, or relatively simple rewiring lighting. I've done tons of lighting replacements myself over the years. It takes some very, very basic, you know, tool skills, you know, wire nuts, some electrical tape, and um, of course, appropriate precautions of turning circuits off, stuff like that. Um, installing smart thermostats and power strips if you don't have those already. And of course, anything that uses hot water, um, it's worth looking at the water usage of those devices. So shower heads and faucets um, are great candidates to help you save both energy and water together. And um, lighting, of course, LEDs have really come into their own over the last, I'd say about five years. They were still not so great in terms of color rendition um, and so forth a few years ago. Now, lots of options and lots of inexpensive options. So prices have also come down tremendously. And um, a lot more information, again, in the resources that I have put in the gray box here on the bottom left. And um, in terms of the water fixtures, EPA WaterSense label is a good guideline for getting good performance. Um, EPA labels, uh, Energy Star WaterSense, they're very helpful because they don't only look at the savings criteria, but also at other performance criteria. So you're less likely to get something that performs um, in other ways that you find unsatisfactory if you go with the EPA labels. Okay, more about electric equipment appliances. Um, these are the more expensive trade outs, of course, but still easy in the sense that if you take out one appliance, you put another one in its place. Um, if you already have electric items that are not super 
efficient, you can replace those with more efficient items. If you're taking out gas items and replacing with efficient, you may need to make sure you have an adequate power hookup. I'll get to that a little bit later. Um, but I've given you some what I think are really terrific resources for finding super efficient items on the web. My particular favorite is this one on the bottom right, marketplace.pge.com. Um, and what this little graphic in the lower right corner shows, um, there's an organization called Enervy that developed this. They use a one zero to 100 scale, this green dot to show how efficient something is relative to the best in class. So I always recommend looking for something that's 90 or better. You can sort or filter in this search engine, for example, by size. This is particularly useful for fridges, which we're you know, not especially talking about here, but it's a very handy feature. You can also search on brand and um, many other features, depending on which item you're looking for. And it'll also tell you, you know, um, consumer reviews and pricing and so forth. So really, really amazing resource. And then of course, energystar.gov has also product information listings. And I'd recommend looking not only for Energy Star, but Energy Star most efficient. So this was a new designation that EPA um, introduced just a few years ago, because what happened was Energy Star rated appliances became so prevalent that they felt there was a compelling need to distinguish those that really performed at the top of the Energy Star scale. So be sure to look for that more complete logo, Energy Star Most Efficient. Okay, third step, here's where it gets a little harder and we're not just plugging in, plugging out at this point, but improving enclosure efficiency. And I, I know I, um, emphasized several times already the importance of a really good quality enclosure. The reason this is third and not first is because it is more challenging. Attics and crawl spaces are a lot easier than walls typically. So those are really good places to start with attics literally as well as figuratively at the top. Um, and again, this is because of um, both sun, solar radiation coming in and night sky radiation going out. Um, crawl spaces, underfloor. Also, this is a big question. It depends on access as to whether this is going to be easy or not. Um, look for other gaps. There are oftentimes missed gaps, things, um, for example, anytime you have mm, like a soffit feature or bathtub installations, there's often poor installation, installation in those areas. Anytime you have um, unusual architectural features, double walls, changes of um, wall height, that sort of thing, there are likely to be great opportunities to improve air sealing and insulation. By the way, air sealing until the last few years wasn't even really recognized as a construction task it's still not recognized as a trade. And this means that it's still, I would say the unwanted stepchild or the neglected stepchild in the world of efficiency. So the vast majority of our homes have not at all intentionally been air sealed. And air sealing failures can represent enormous liabilities in terms of energy performance. So they may represent, let's say, as much as 30% reduction in, in effectiveness of your heating and cooling systems. Because what you're doing is you're, let's say, in the heating season, injecting heated air into an enclosure that immediately allows much of that heated air to escape without benefiting you. So it's a really good idea to look into opportunities for getting air sealing done as well as improving insulation installation. Um, there is a, a discipline called home performance contractors or building performance contractors that really specialize in this work. They're not always easy to find, but worth seeking out. And I know there are some in the Tri-County region. 
so I would encourage you to find them and um, perhaps my uh, colleagues at 3C Ren can help direct you to some of the folks who are doing that type of work. Um, upgrading insulation and walls can be more challenging because of course your walls are enclosed, but there are techniques with one that's called drill and fill that can be done sometimes from the interior, sometimes from the exterior. Again, this is gonna work best if you find people who've done this type of work before. So um, be sure and ask people's experience doing the type of work. How many projects have they done of this type? Get references. Um, by the way, this is a sort of a standard lecture of mine with clients. Always ask for references, always check references because there's this funny situation that occurs where um, you might get a reference for someone and assume that because you've been given the reference that that person did great work, but not necessarily. So let's say um, you ask a, a trade person to give you the names of a couple of homeowners they've done work for. You could call all of them and find a pretty wide range of responses from the homeowners from, oh yeah, the work was fine to, mm, yeah, uh, well, not so great to, I would never hire that person again. And you think, well, why would that contractor provide those names if they weren't confident that they were going to be recommended by the person? This is sometimes because the homeowners having people work in their homes can be very reticent in sharing their concerns. And so this is understandable. It's also really unfair to the tradespeople because they need to know if the work they're doing is not meeting the needs of their clients. But it does happen and surprisingly frequently. So as homeowners, check references, contractors, you have confidence in your work, you know, share those references when you're confident. If you're not sure, if I've cast doubt in your mind, always check with the homeowners you've worked with and say, may I use your name as a reference? Is there anything that I could have done better when working with you? Again, voice of experience here. I've been in this industry for um, 45 years and um, heard it all, seen it all. Okay, next, um, again, not such an easy thing to do, but I mentioned earlier how windows can confer lots of benefits. They're also a very high ticket item. And the better the windows you buy, the more of a high ticket item they are. That said, um, one of the things I didn't talk about is how much new windows can improve the look as well as the comfort and performance of homes. So many homeowners aren't really happy with the looks of their older window units. And it can be a huge, huge facelift for a home to get new windows. That may be as attractive as the thermal benefits, fire safety benefits, and um, sorry, I spaced out. There was another one, but we'll, <laughs> it'll come back to me or you're already thinking, I know what she meant. So here we are, a couple of the parameters to look at if you're considering window replacements are solar heat gain coefficient, SHGC, and I would always recommend looking for an SHGC of 0 0.30 or less, and then U factor, which is thermal performance of the unit, not just the glass, but the whole unit, and that as well of 0 0.30 or less. So this is two funny cases where when we think of thermal performance, most folks are familiar with R values, where an R value, a higher R value is a better R value. In the case of both of these window parameters, a lower number generally means higher performance. Now there are still some sort of passive solar heating advocates who like um, a higher solar heat gain coefficient because they want to admit more solar heat. I would advise 
a lot of caution with that because as we tighten up our building enclosures, it can be very easy to overheat. And this is why I recommend a top, a ceiling of a 0 0.30 solar heat gain coefficient. So just a couple of things to look at. Um, shading devices can also be really effective in reducing your cooling needs in the hot season. Shading devices on the exterior are more effective than on the interior, but there are window coverings that also have some cooling load reduction benefits. Okay, moving on, you've, now you've done all the stuff that doesn't, isn't really complicated, it might be more involved or expensive. We move on to electrical service here. So going back to your list of all your future heating, or sorry, electrical loads um, I identified in step one, we'll come back to those. And you're gonna need to work with an electrical professional or a general contractor or a home performance contractor or an electrification specialist to make sure that your electrical panel has enough capacity for all the things that you plan to add. Alternatively, if that's going to be a problem to replace your electrical panel or inordinately expensive, for whatever reason, it's not an easy thing to do, there are ways of electrifying without necessarily having to enlarge your electrical panel. So I have colleagues who've coined the term AMP diet, um, to sort of figure out how to make do with the panel you have. And a couple of strategies here are there are these things called plug sharing devices. I've shown a couple of examples here. Um, some of them allow a dryer and an electric vehicle, for example, to share a single outlet or two electric vehicles. Obviously, that's only going to work if your car and your dryer are in the same space. Um, but oftentimes that is the case. <laughs> and then there's also low amperage equipment. So combined condensing washer dryers come in low amperage and heat pump water heaters as well. So, and I believe we are starting to see more and more of these options coming on the market as there's growing awareness around the country and beyond of this particular problem, electric homes that wish to electrify and don't have adequate electrical service. So if the solutions that you would need aren't quite there yet, wait six months or a year and they probably will be. Okay, and then finally. So, Anne, yes. Um, yeah, there's just a question asking about smart panels, such as the Square D uh, Energy Center or SPAN panel. Yeah, that's actually a good one. In fact, I should probably add that. Um, the smart panels have a much more sophisticated functionality and can help sort of manage loads um, sort of on a time basis. In other words, if there's a, a demand for multiple draws at the same time, it may um, temporarily pause one while the other takes place. So that is another option to look at. Um, glad you mentioned that. Whoever raised that, thank you for raising the point. And I will make a point of incorporating that next time I update my slides. Cool. Um, okay, moving on to upgrading heating and cooling systems. Again, this is where it can, we're, we're edging into the more and more complicated um, territory where it can be more challenging to address the new systems where they replace older systems. In new construction, by the way, these are non issues, right? In new construction, you can just start all electric from the get go. You've eliminated an entire system from the house, the gas system. So it's actually simpler and less expensive. So when we talk about electrification, it is the transition from existing natural gas or propane service to electric service. Okay, so when we're replacing gas fired heating equipment with heat pumps, there are a couple things to be keep to keep in mind, several things in mind, but for both, we want um, the heat pumps for space and water heating. Sizing is really important. And there are a lot of providers out there who still rely on sort of rules of thumb or numbers that they have used for years, often decades, 
that are actually out of date will be particularly out of date and inappropriate, again, in a more efficient home, a home with a more efficient enclosure. So what we refer to as an ACA manuals, ACCA, Air Conditioning Contractors of America, has established these protocols for calculating heating loads and air conditioning loads. So make sure that whomever you're working with is going to do ACA calcs to size your equipment properly. Next tip, air handlers should be placed within condition space, which is a part of home, your home that's heated and or cooled. Um, and this is because it will function more efficiently in that space. If you are using ducted systems, the duct systems should be inspected and tested to make sure that they are providing proper airflow and they are not leaking unduly. And if any deficiencies are found, those deficiencies should be addressed in the process of making your upgrades. And note the bubble here at the bottom, my little green statement. Improving all aspects of system performance can double the performance of the system and cut demand in half. So it's, it can be a very big deal. A lot of um, what you'll hear or read about heating and cooling systems focuses on the equipment efficiency. And certainly, particularly in my discussion of water heaters, I really emphasize that. But in both water heating, and I would say even more so in space conditioning, the whole system design is hugely important. You know, where are all the components in relation to each other? How good a job was done in laying out ducting, in installing that ducting, in making sure that none of it is crimped, crushed, you know, leaky, et cetera. Properly sealed at boots, there are all kinds of issues that um, it's kind of a hundred silver BBs situation as opposed to a silver bullet. So yes, changing out equipment is hugely important to electrify um, and therefore address our climate goals. And yet the whole system also matters enormously from an overall performance and efficiency perspective. Okay, coming back to everything's been electrified. So the last thing you might do is to add on a renewable energy system and or batteries already talked quite a bit about this. Um, but again, getting sizing done properly is also important for solar. Um, you wanna make sure that you are getting a solar system that's going to kind of optimize your financial benefits. And by the way, it was one of the fun things about updating the slide deck this time is I was able to change this percentage federal tax credit. It had gone down to 26% with the Inflation Reduction Act. It's now bumped back up to 30%. So this is really exciting. And I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, that 30% is going to be in place for the next 10 years. If anybody knows otherwise, correct me, but um, I'm pretty sure I caught that in one of the informational sources that I've been taking in since the Inflation Reduction Act was passed. Lots to be excited about there. Or again, you can also choose your utility or CCA providers, 100% clean electric plan. Again, some resources here about um, both batteries and the federal tax credits. So be sure and look into that as well as any other incentives that may be available through the state, through the tech program, through your local utility, through your community choice aggregator. And um, again, staff at 3C REN can no doubt help you locate all those incentives. There's also incentive um, help locate incentives through the tech program website and the switches on website as well. That's another one worth mentioning. Okay, so, so we've gone through this sort of step-by-step -step thing and you theoretically could do all of this at once, one big project, one fell swoop, but realistically you might wanna phase it and you might wanna phase it differently than I have outlined. One thing to look at in electrifying equipment is to really think about what's the life expectancy, um, something of our, of our devices. This is something most of us don't think about at all until one of these equipment items dies. 
And there seems to be a sort of a Murphy's Law propensity for appliances to die at the most inopportune times. You know, right before a holiday meal where you're going to have a bunch of people in your house and you need to cook for them, or you're going to have house guests and maybe babies with diapers and tons of things that need to be washed and your washer or dryer goes out. So be sure to think about that. Now you may say, oh gosh, I don't really even know how old my appliance is. Um, maybe it was here when I moved into the house. You can find out appliance age, usually by looking at serial numbers. I've given a link up here in the green bubble where you can find at least furnace, air conditioner, water heating, heater ages. I'm betting that you can find out the age of any appliance with a diligent enough web search on that appliance's brand, name, and serial number. So I just need to find the nameplate on the equipment and get to work. So if something is getting close to the end of its life expectancy, I would recommend considering buying in advance because of the inconvenience of having the outage. And secondly, particularly in the case of some of the equipment that is less common, and that includes Many of the um, heat pump items are still not as nearly as widely available in the marketplace as their conventional counterparts. Um, similar situation with regard to induction ranges and particularly in the code environment when so many things are in constrained supply, I would really recommend replacing preemptively. So find out the age of these items and consider setting up kind of a, a replacement schedule for yourself based on your items ages. Other things to think about in terms of phasing is that whenever you have a trade person on site for whatever reason, it's gonna be less expensive to have them do multiple projects than to do parcel those projects out over time because there's a mobilization cost for them just to schedule with you to come out on site, you know, have all the right things on the truck and all that. Um, and also, you know, all of the overhead and accounting. So always see if there are multiple ways to benefit from the presence of a trade person when you are going to engage them at all. Um, buying an electric vehicle, that has implications for electrification. It's also going to reduce your fuel costs for transportation. If you factor that in, let's say you might be due to replace a car in the near future, maybe think about the savings in the operations, your day-to-day your -day from the fuel kind of going towards other expenses that you may be undertaking. So if you kind of bundle these mentally, it may seem more affordable or desirable than thinking about them entirely separately. Batteries with solar electric, I mentioned that you're going to accrue a lot more benefits from batteries in conjunction with photovoltaics. So it may be helpful to do those at the same time. Um, one may help justify the cost of the other. And particularly, that we often talk about in the energy world about non-energy benefits. And this is particularly important, I think, for those of us who are building professionals and dealing with homeowners. Energy benefits are often not the things that get them the most excited. The things that may get them most excited are architectural benefits. I mentioned that with the, the aesthetics of windows, for example. Comfort benefits, they may have hidden complaints about comfort in their home that honestly may not even occur to them to raise with you because I, I, the way I think about this is people view their homes much the way they view their pets. Like it just is the way it is. I really can't influence its behavior very much. Well, that may be more true with my cats, for example, than it is with my house. And with clients, they may not have any realization that they actually can change 
some of the comfort issues and they wouldn't occur to them to discuss them with you unless you ask about it. So it's worth asking about how these things all play together. So if there's any remodeling going on at all, if you're in a conversation about, you know, doesn't matter what it is, think about if there are synergies of making other performance improvements at the same time. Similarly, even if you have a client or you as a homeowner are entertaining electrification, be creative and think, oh, well, what should I do at the same time? How can I make my budget extend farther by meeting multiple objectives through the same process? Okay, so that's it. That's the, the, the triumvirate, efficiency, resiliency, and electrification, and how they all play together, and how I'm encouraging you to think about them together. And a very short quiz. This is just reinforcement. You won't be graded, but um, what do you think? of these four steps that you might want to do first. You can use the, the poll to respond. Well, so far it's unanimous. Oh, we have another one, another opinion, replacing old appliances. Most are saying, list the electric items you plan to get in the future. That's my preferred step. But replacing old appliances, sure, go for it. I wouldn't say that's a wrong answer. Thanks for playing. <laughs> All right. Oh, in case you guys didn't see that. There we go. Five out of six said, list all the electric items. And that was my answer as well. But as I said, it doesn't mean that there's a wrong one. And here are some other resources for you. Um, there are live links to get all of these documents. And again, every single one of these resources that I have shown here has many, 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 many other resources within it. So I wanna encourage you to um, dive in and do as much homework as you're inclined to do. So thank you for attending today and I would love to take any questions that you have for me. Yeah, any questions? Yeah. There was a, a question in the chat um, asking if you could discuss where the state is going in the building codes with respect to moving towards all electric buildings. Yeah, great question. So um, the 2022 code, we're really just looking to further encourage electrification. There will be um, more incentives for um, all electric new construction. There will be more incentives for solar and for batteries. Um, the word on the street is, that's the 2022 code. The 2025 code, which will of course go into effect January 1st, 2026. I say of course, because in California, the name of the code is always the year prior to it actually goes into effect or the day, if you think of this, December 31st, January 1st. So the 2022 code will go into effect January 1st of next year. The 2025 code will go into first January, ugh, January 21st. Sorry, <laughs> I can't even talk anymore. January 1st, 2026. Too many numbers. Um, Anyway, the 2025 code, the word is that it will be an all electric code. That said, it's not over till it's over. So um, that may or may not happen. Personally, I think that's the right move if we all wanna have a habitable planet for ourselves and our future generations. Um, but I'm sure there are others who feel differently. Any more questions? There's no other questions in the chat, but there's a comment saying that someone has done a cost analysis of how much the average fuel consumption costs over a 25 year period, and it is a lot. The annual fuel consumption of? Doesn't specify. Ah, interesting. 
Yeah, there's um, there's a really good study that was done by E3 for the state of California that um, showed projections of both electric fuel costs um, as compared to mixed fuel homes. Um, and there are also, it might be the same study or different one that shows anticipated increases in gas fuel prices for customers um, over, I forget what that period is, um, but it's, I think it's a, maybe a five or a 10 year period. Um, as electrification increases and the state continues to progress towards its climate goals. So I don't have, I don't think I have links to both of those in here, but they should both be findable if you go to the, uh, what do they call it? It's E3 Energy something economics. Um, hang on a second, I will find them. So I can give you the proper name of the company, E3 California. The website is E3, that is numeral three, C-A-I-N-C dot com. I can put that in the chat. Okay, let's see. Everyone, okay, here we go. Keith. E3CAINC.com. Yeah, they've done a number of studies looking at um, electrification going into California's future. So, so if you want more if, stats. Mm -hmm. if, if you do want to hear what the analysis I did was based on, I can kind of outline it very quickly. Sure. Who is this? This is Joshua Luisi with Allen Construction. Oh, great. Um, so roughly speaking, I did this analysis from gas cost $4 and 25 cents a gallon. So uh, an average fuel economy of, I think I had it at, uh, let's see, it was, uh, just shy of 30, uh, 30 gallon uh, miles to the gallon. Uh, that equates to about 545 gallons of gas in a year. Uh, and when you compare, even while including the cost of the solar system itself and how much you pay per kilowatt hour of all of that, you end up saving $57,000 over the course of 25 years. Net gain. Oh, oh, right. So this is, you're saying this is um, trading off your, an EV purchase for solar. No, no, no. I'm not trading. Uh, so the cars, they cost the same in this model. Right. What I'm saying is that if you weigh the cost of the installation of the solar uh, equipment, the battery backup system and all of that against the gas, because this, the, these panels, they're done after 25 years. Right. 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 Yeah. All these systems. So even when you factor in the cost of that system compared with the cost of just pouring all that money down at the pump. Right. So 545 gallons per year at what's gas right now. Uh, we'll call Almost five. seven bucks. All right, so we'll call it six bucks a gallon <laughs> times six uh, times twenty-five. That's eighty-one thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars in gas. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I, I didn't years. I didn't say it very well, but again, I think what you're saying is that buying an EV will um, more than pay for your solar and battery system. I think that. Uh, yes, that is the inference. And to the tune yeah. of, at time of this analysis, over a period of 25 years, it'll save you $58,000. Uh, yeah. We'll have to replace the end, uh, the entire system at the end of its lifespan. Cool. Of course, you're, all, you're probably going to buy more than one car in a 25-year period. Okay, then you just go ahead and double all that. If you're do, doing two cars, then money saved on gasoline is $115,919. Cool. Thanks for sharing that. Thanks for sharing that. That should that should be persuasive. You would think so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I like it. I hadn't thought it through quite that lens. But um, yeah, beautiful. Thank you, Joshua. Any other questions or comments anybody would like to throw out there?
nope, then we can uh, call it a wrap and it's almost exactly on time. So thanks again for coming and participating today all and have a great afternoon.